Thank you. So today I am here ostensibly to talk about various representations of trans people in ancient times. What I am actually here to do is to talk about a dismissal of binaries. Let me begin, however, by making sure that I acknowledge that I am not a trans person, but a trans ally. I am also in no way trying to co-opt the trans voice, uh, but I am trying to bring my personal perspective to the discussion. Also, I will be using terms like people and persons as definitionally different. People for me means a grouping, whereas persons is a group of individuals that are uh, part of a community. I want to create this sense of individuality within the term uh, persons. Several years ago, a few students uh, who were, uh, came to me who were very concerned about the transphobia that was occurring here at Emerson College. They were wondering what could be done in order to combat this phobia. As this discussion evolved, they asked me if I would not mind directing a show that dealt with these issues. This is how the first queer show was born. I recently did another version of the queer show as uh, the issue of transphobia is still coming up in my classes. The queer show consists of vignettes, poems, dance pieces, and other performative acts created by members of the queer community, not only here at Emerson College, but from self-identified queers from the greater Boston area. I am very proud to have been a part of these productions and am attempting to honor what I have learned through the, these devising processes of the shows with this talk. I am terribly upset by what has been happening in our country vis-a-vis -vis laws that are being enacted in some states from the, what we refer to as the restroom law in North Carolina to the counseling bill in Tennessee, we are seeing a group of people fighting very hard to limit the rights and options of the LGBTQI individuals and communities. You see, many people in this country believe that their religious beliefs outweigh the societal needs of those who are already marginalized. Al Franken joked back in the 80s, just because you are born again does not give you twice as many rights as everyone else. <laughs> I used to have a friend uh, that refused to acknowledge the rights of trans people. Our arguments would end with her stating, God does not make mistakes. I found that statement appalling. First of all, I found it rather presumptuous that she would know the mind of God. <laughs> Second of all, I found it rather offensive that she would refer to a trans person as a mistake. Before I get into the bulk of my talk, I thought it would be important for me to give a little bit of history on how we view gender and the changes that we have made in the past 50 years. You see, initially, gender was an assumed category. If one was male, and heterosexual, we assumed that they were masculine. If one was female and homosexual, we also assumed that they were masculine. Well, as we can tell that this is a very problematic thing. So psychologists and sociologists started revisiting uh, this idea, and they separated out the idea of gender into its own category. In this manner, gender was not decided based upon sexuality, the problem with this, with this uh, change, or even with this change, is that it relies on a binary. Later, I will argue that this binary is purely constructed, as are the uh, binaries of biological sex, uh, the three dominant categories of sexuality. These are all things that we made up. Right? And now for the awful truth. <coughs> I purposely use the term trans in an anachronistic fashion when, it, when I proposed my TED Talk. I had no intention of using the term trans to uh, describe peoples and persons from ancient cultures. What I did want to discuss were certain members of ancient communities who were viewed as holy and held uh, positions that were revered. One question that I am asked a lot is, 
how did societies drift away from revering those who did not fall into the binary to a place where such persons were reviled? Well, a lot of that has to do with major shifts in cultural mores during the times of this woman right here, Queen Victoria, or as I refer to her as Old Vic. <laughs> of these peoples and persons, the first I wanted to discuss are the Kwajasara of the South Asian subcontinent. You will note that I have put the term hijra in parentheses as, as this term comes from the subcontinent's colonial past. Although that term may be more prevalent, there is a lot of good work being done to remove that term from the lexicon. In order to understand the function of the Kwajasara in South Asian cultures, I am going to digress a little bit and give a very, very broad understanding of Hinduism. This can by no means uh, be an extensive understanding of the religion and of all the various sects that exist. I can only give you, at best, a generalized depiction of the philosophy behind the religion. A fundamental belief in Hinduism is that of reincarnation. The soul is continually reincarnated until it eventually joins the Godhead. These are, there are uh, three aspects to a person's existence in the Hindu religion. We have the body, we have the spirit, and we have the soul. The body is our physical presence and dies at the end of each lifetime. Once the body has died, there is a conversation that occurs between the spirit and the soul. In this conversation, the spirit and the soul decide what should occur in the next lifetime. Once those decisions have been made, the spirit then fades away. This leaves the soul to reincarnate with another spirit and another body. The conversation that the spirit and the soul have has to do with experiences. You see, in order to join the Godhead, the soul has to go through all experiences. It is because of this necessity to experience all the things that uh, life has to offer, the Kwajasara were not ostracized from society. In fact, God is represented as being both male and female simultaneously. I have here an image that represents this duality. This is the god Shiva in a combined male and female state. This simultaneity was held, high, was held in high societal esteem as well as religious esteem. In fact, the Kwajasara was given the status of guru or teacher, and as gurus, they did have chelas or disciples. Now, only a person of high religious status would be able to have a disciple. The Kwajasara were revered in society because of this duality in gender. All momentous occasions were marked with the Kwajasara performing. Every birth ritual, marriage, and funeral was not complete without a performance. Earlier, I had alluded to a major cultural shift uh, under Queen Victoria. It was during this, uh, the British Raj that laws against homosexuality were enacted in pre-partition India. At the same time, the Kwajasara were ostracized from society. They were forced into their own enclaves where the majority of them had to work as commercial sex workers in order to survive. It was not until very recently that the Kwajasara were, was allowed to uh, gain their own identity card and to be classified as a third sex. Even though they have been given the right to vote and there are certain Kwajasara members of parliament, there is still, they are still reviled by most of the society. They have a very interesting duality within the culture. They are still needed to perform various, at various occasions, but are feared and not allowed to mingle with the rest of society. I would like to now switch to uh, members of the indigenous tribes or First Nations here in North America. It is in the majority of these peoples that we see what is termed as the two-spirit. Prior to the colonization of North America, there was a community that could be constructed within the vast uh, majority, uh, commonality, excuse me, that could be constructed within the vast majority of these indigenous tribes when it came to the two-spirit persons. 
First off, many of the tribes believed in a masculine and feminine aspect to both humans and animals. There was quite a bit of diversity in how various persons in various tribes were defined. We are aware that two spirited persons were able to marry. This was marriage uh, for the most part based on, uh, for the most part not based on, excuse me, on original biological sex, but on the gender of the person. We do know, for example, in the Navajo tribes that it was requisite that a masculine person marry a feminine person. I also want to make clear, very clear, that in this instance, just like that with the Kwajasara, terms like homosexual, bisexual, or trans do not apply. We also know that members of the two-spirit communities were believed to have special sensor qualities. Uh, by this, it was meant that they could see, hear, smell, and taste at a higher level than their non-two-spirited counterparts. This ability allowed the two-spirit persons to communicate with the natural world, spirits, and ancestors. They would also be called upon to interpret dreams and other signs presented to the tribe at large. You see, the two-spirited persons were a necessary part of both the cultural and religious duties of the tribe. They were appointed special rules by the village elders and given duties only they could fulfill. A lot of the information we have about the Two-Spirit peoples come from a colonial understanding, which of course tried very hard to fit the Two-Spirit person into a Western model. Without an exact counterpart, unfortunately, this understanding led to a vast amount of confusion about the Two-Spirit persons. It wasn't until the 1960s that an attempt was made to break free from the, the colonial understanding and to mine definitions and connotations from the indigenous tribes' perspectives. It was in the 1990s there was a movement of LGB people trying to reclaim the two-spirit person as their own. While this is an understandable step in the defining of the two-spirit person, it is now seen as a bit off the mark. Contemporary scholarship has moved the two-spirit person away from identifiers such as LGBTQ, uh, as none of these work connotatively to describe the two-spirited persons. The reason this is, is because these terms, LGBTQ, are culturally specific and one runs into a danger in uh, trying to apply such cultural definitions to uh, a society that pre-existed them. I want to present an alternate way of viewing gender. Here in Boston, we call our subway system the T, and I would like to use it as an example for my proposal. This is a map of the orange line. Now for many, gender is basically either one end or the other. It is either Oak Grove or Forest Hill. <laughs> there is no in between. While some believe that there can only be the binary, there are others who view gender as a spectrum. We can be Oak Grove, both Forest Hill, or somewhere in between. We must, however, pick a stop along the spectrum like so many commuters do every day. This is an image of the green line. You will note that it has five endpoints and therefore five possibilities with a variety of possibilities along the way. All of a sudden, the options are numerous. I will even go one further with this line in that we are not forced to pick one stop like our computer. We can make this line fluid in this particular example. The issue I have here is that this example is still fettered to the one line. We cannot escape the parameters of the green line. The next logical option would be to use the T system in its entirety. We have before us um, a myriad of uh, options now. One would think that this would be the ideal. The rhizome theory, if you will. Basically, the idea that there is no centrality there. But the problem is 
is we are still tethered to the term gender, even with this proposal. I propose that we lift our gaze above the idea of gender, to use vocabulary that is not confining. We need to rise above gender, thus the hovercraft in this last image. <laughs> I am thrilled that we have a new generation of persons that are using they, them, and their, instead of words like z and here, as I was taught to use when I was their age. You see, they, them, and their remove gender instead of trying to combine gender terms. Some of my generation look at millennials as an apathetic group and fear what is to come when we grow old. I have no such fear, as I firmly believe that these young people are already changing how the world works through sheer force of will. For us, love, peace, kindness, and understanding were ideas. For them, they are actions. Thank you. <laughs>